Well, good afternoon, everyone. If you can take your seat, please, we can start our program. Well, good afternoon, and on behalf of the College of Engineering for Lawrence Tech University, I'd like to welcome all of you for the 2023 White Coat Ceremony, and congratulations. <laughs> Actually, this is our second year for the master's degree in cardiovascular perfusion. And I'm very grateful to our president, Dr. Tarek Sop is here today. From day one, I asked him about this program, and he said, tell me what you need. And he was very supportive, and I'd like to make sure that he would be, he would be listening to him in a minute. So he would be talking more about it. But certainly, we are grateful to him. And I'd like also to introduce the previous president, Dr. Mark Gill. Thank you so much, sir, for being here today. And also we have today with us our provost. Uh, he's here today and you will hear from him, Dr. Heist. Thank you so much for being here, sir. Thank you. As most of you know, especially students, this is the first perfusion program in the state of Michigan and one few of few in the United States. And we are so grateful to CCS who's right here. Sean, thank you so much. And where's Betty? She's here. Thank you so much for being here. We greatly appreciate your work and your help. I know we cannot accept more than 10 students. And believe it or not, the first year we had over 100 applications, and we did not even announce the program. And Sean is telling me that we have more than 100 students also for this year. But unfortunately, we cannot accept more than what we have. And yeah, sir, 12, 12, that's correct. <laughs> And actually, I just talked to Betty, and she said, next year after the accreditation, we're going to get into more than that. And um, I'd like to take a minute here to recognize the chair of the biomedical engineering. But this, is, this is where the program actually is housed. She's sitting somewhere here. Thank you. Oh, would you please stand? Yawan is a very, very humble person. And she wouldn't talk too much about what she has done behind the scene but she was a dynamometer behind all this. She was a dyno pulling me here, pulling me there, talking to the president, talking to the pros, talking to Sean and everybody else. So yeah, and we really appreciate all the work, you and your faculty, and I have seen all of them here today. Thank you guys, John, and well, sorry, raise your hand. <laughs> Thank you guys for being here, Eric, and the entire group. We really appreciate all the work you have been doing in biomedical engineering and for making this program really, really big. A few minutes ago, I was talking to Dr. Johnston. He's right here. You, you will hear from him in a minute. And he told me a lot, and the president, about the history of the cardiovascular. And I didn't know all that stuff that you just told me. So certainly, I asked him if he can, when he talks, walk through this so everybody knows exactly where this came from. With this being said, I'd like now to invite our provost, Dr. Richard Heist, to say his remark. Dr. Heist. Thank you, sir. Thanks, uh, Dean Grease. Let me add my welcome uh, to, to all of you here, uh, new students in this really remarkable program. And also let me express my appreciation for the team effort that it took, not only to bring this about, but to help it grow. And it's going to grow into a, not only a larger program, but it's going to grow in, in, in more diverse in terms of its impact on the College of Health Science as well as the College of Engineering. That's our focus on horizontal, interdisciplinary. So you have engineering and health sciences working together on a really remarkable program. When you guys, you may have already been to CCS to look at uh, some, it's remarkable technology. I was really impressed when, uh, when I had the opportunity to, to visit. It's, it's truly an innovative, innovative program and it's, technologically focused, which is part of who we are here at Lawrence Tech. But I'm going to share with you um, that your involvement and my involvement with, with the cardiovascular program and, and CCS means a little bit more to me than, than, than just the provost. After I visited CCS, I went out with uh, the dean and uh, Sean and his team showed me around and into that great simulated operating room they have with the perfusion equipment. A really impressive operation. But right away I flashed back to something that, that, happened, that happened to me. I explained to these folks that, you know, um, 
not only is this interesting to me as a technical person, as a, as a professional, but it, uh, it's interesting to me as a person because I was under that machine at one point. I had a bypass graph done, and I didn't know it at the time. I never met who you will be when you do that same thing. The patient won't, won't know you, but it's a remarkable thing that you do. And, and so I explained that I, and, and right away, Sean's team said, wait, uh, where did you do this? And when did you, I said, well, this was in 2016. I was down at Sarasota Memorial. And, we can tell you what machine it was, and we can identify the person, our person, who was overseeing the operation. I thought, wow, that is really important. But it made a connection, a really personal connection to me uh, with respect to this program. So it, 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 it just means a little bit more because I've been there and done that. And then I actually saw the machine that was literally keeping me alive during that, uh, I guess not fairly routine, but, but uh, really personal <laughs> surgery when you write down to it. So I'm going to leave you with just an, ad, an admonition because of the personal impact that it had on me and on others that uh, uh, go through similar situations. So after you leave here and after you're finished with CCS and all your work and you, and you go out with your master's degree and your, your certification, um, you're going to be part of teams that literally hold people's lives in their hands. This is true, and they won't know it. You know, they won't know who you are, they won't remember you, but the fact of the matter is, that's what you'll be doing. And in, in, in a very real sense, this is a manifestation of what I've for years always talked about with respect to engineering, and now, of course, with its uh, connection to healthcare here, this is a service to humanity manifestation of what it means to be a person in the healthcare industry or in, in the engineering industry, so to speak. It is a service to humanity profession. So don't ever forget, when you go about following your career, becoming famous, and whatever, whatever paths you choose, you know, don't ever forget that this is really, uh, there's a fundamental aspect to, what it, to the care that you're giving and, and the, the hold and the impact you have on these, on these people's lives. So always know uh, that what you do with your education and, 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 the, and the professional training that you've had here, you will impact people's lives. It certainly impacted mine. To this day, I remember what your predecessors did for me and what you will do for other people as well. So again, I, I offer my welcome and my hearty congratulations for achieving this level of expertise. And I'm looking, I will be looking closely at your level of progress and success as you finish your work here and move on out into, uh, into the profession. So congratulations again. Thank you so much, Dr. Heist. Now, it gives me a great pleasure and great honor to introduce our president, Dr. Tarek Soap. Please, Dr. Soap. Thank you, Dean Grace. Congratulations. Uh, I'm incredibly proud to welcome you to Lawrence Technological University. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say something, again, personal, not incredibly personal as a provost and his own amazing experience, but something about why I ended up being here. Uh, Lawrence Tech is a very special place. Um, when I was thinking of changing employers about three years back, uh, I, I started looking at technological universities in the country. Um, every job is a technology job these days. We all know that. Whatever profession you're in, you have to be very savvy in the application and using of transformative technology to change people's life whether you're an engineer, whether you're a cardiovascular perfusionist, whether you're an architect, that's the world that we live in. So I wanted to be affiliated uh, in a leadership role in a technologically focused institution of higher learning. There are 6,000 universities in the US, 6,000. 3,000 too many if you ask me, but that's a different, <laughs> a different discussion that we can have later. And out of these, there were only 56 universities in the whole country that were technologically focused by mission, by vision, and by name. And out of these, only half were comprehensive doctoral, meaning they offer undergraduate degrees, graduate degrees in all disciplines, but ensure that the graduates 
come out very technologically trained in the discipline that they study. 28, less than a half percent of all the universities in the country. And out of these, 13 were private. I wanted to be a private setting, but that's a different story. Uh, you are part of a very unique set of higher education institutions that truly understands the future of work. The future of work is very different in the 21st century than what we're all used to. Futures work is very innovative. Futures work, as the provost mentioned, is very horizontal or interdisciplinary. Uh, the skill sets that you will develop in this truly eminent program is very interdisciplinary in nature. It involves dealing with patients and bedside manner and dealing with colleagues on teams and dealing with technology, utilizing it and appropriately applying it for the situation that you're in. It involves medicine. And, and, and again, it's a very classic example of every job in the future. Every job in the future is going to be interdisciplinary. And for professionals of the future to be functional, productive, and efficient, and truly really help humanity address the challenges of the 21st century, there will be a need for professionals to have multiple skill sets in various disciplines in order to be efficient and impactful uh, on society in general. Uh, so you should be very proud. You're joining a great university, uh, one of truly an elite set of universities that are comprehensive, doctoral, technological, and private in our case. And not only that, you're probably joining the program with the lowest admission percentage <laughs> in Loras Technological University, given the numbers of applications and how many you accept. You've proven that you academically are at the appropriate level in order to be tackled and succeed in this program. I have every confidence that not only you will succeed, but thrive in your endeavors for the next couple of years and turn out to be amazing professionals that we will all be proud of. And you will not forget us after you graduate. You're going to come back, help your fellow students as our proud alumni, and help the university move forward. Uh, our current provost has a parallel title. He's also the interim dean of the College of Health Sciences. Uh, so he plays multiple roles at Lawrence Tech. And, and I can tell you by the time you graduate from here, that College of Health Sciences, uh, which now is home to at least you know, three uh, uh, programs and your program in an affiliated manner uh, will probably have grown to eight or nine different programs. Uh, while you're here in these two and a half years, I know you'll be incredibly busy uh, uh, studying, working in CCS and doing amazing things. Uh, but all I can tell you, these are two and a half amazing years to explore uh, other aspects of Lawrence Technological University not only within your program and within the great faculty who will be teaching you, but also across the colleges and across the university in general. Uh, this university has amazing resources. It's a great time to explore connections between your profession and what you're studying with other programs in the College of Engineering, in the College of Business and Information Technology. Uh, uh, the, the, the way things are changing and the applications of areas like artificial intelligence and technology and virtual and simulated realities in all the disciplines is cross-cutting. And you are in a place where you can really explore amazing advances in research development and instructions. So utilize your time efficiently to explore that also in addition to studying within your field. Uh, I, I have to give thanks to uh, our great uh, leaders and our colleagues in CCS for the amazing help and support, uh, and also uh, in our biomedical engineering department. Uh, this program, the inception of this program was really uh, under the leadership of uh, uh, President Emeritus, Verinder Bodgel, and uh, we are very grateful uh, for him. Uh, so we're really all following in the footsteps of what he had initiated three years ago. Uh, Dean Grace uh, has, has been incredibly accommodating to me and uh, Dr. Mudgill in starting this program on such a fast pace, and we're grateful to our partners in CCS. And, uh, of course, I'm immensely grateful to our provost for taking the helm uh, uh, of the College of Health Sciences 
which I know he cannot wait to uh, hire a new dean for the College of Health Sciences, which hopefully will happen soon. Uh, again, have a wonderful time. We're very proud that you have joined us. I know they have the capability to succeed and do really wonderful things. Um, there is no job more humane than healthcare. Uh, what you do affects not only people, but their families and their communities. Uh, there is no better profession to be in. Three of my kids are in the healthcare profession, so none of them wanted to be an engineer, actually, but, uh, which I think they were wrong. But anyway, that's. Uh, but in any case, uh, again, best of luck, best wishes for continuing successes in all of your future endeavors, and I hope and I'm sure that you will thrive at Lawrence Tech. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Soap, for your kind remarks. Really appreciate that. Now we come to the really, really greedy Nidhi and uh, the person that's been behind the program and has been great help to me and to all the faculty members. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kevin Bakaskar. And please, join me up here, please. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've said from the beginning, and uh, people around us who are so close to us have heard me say over and over again, if you build it, just like the Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come, and um, how quickly they have come in droves. And you guys are the next class that we have had, and it's just a tribute to the exceptional people that we've been able to surround ourselves with. Um, we talk about teams when we do open heart surgery. Um, Yes, it is a team, but everybody here, this is a family. It really is a family of people who are passionate about educating all of you, which we've done for so many years. So um, this is now having a first class and seeing people come back. It's like an Irish wedding. I'm an Irish Catholic, and this is like an Irish wedding seeing all of you. So it just gives you tingles and everything. A um, couple of things, people who know me, I think the last nine people who said, hey, don't talk too much, all right? So I'm going to stay on script. I know the Finelli women start to panic when I go <laughs> off script. So, but um, I'll start here. So to our students, welcome to Lawrence Technological University and the start of your journey to become a perfusionist. As you look around, you can clearly see, and clearly see, I've been involved with a lot of universities, and it's a testament to you gentlemen who are in the front row here, who, uh, without a doubt, always say, tell me when, tell me where, and I'll be there, and you hold up to that. Um, so, um, although this is a new program, the professors and clinical instructors, when you look around, you get to know them better, have decades of teaching behind them. Every professor that you come in contact with is going to be associated with so many other university-based programs. So when we compare ourselves to medicine and nursing, our profession is very young. In June 1972, the first perfusion students completed their training to the Texas Medi Heart Medical Center. You asked the perfect question before we came in this room, and I added a little bit more quickly. So we're going to cover the history, because I think those of you who don't know the history of this, it's, it's truly extraordinary. And what your children and your spouses and your family members are about to uh, take on here. So your new profession has grown to 18 programs around the nation. It's incredible that there's just 18 programs. So there's more than 100 graduates per year and over 4,500 practicing perfusionists in 2023 within the United States. So despite that, the nation still needs every perfusionist we can train. Our profession is forecast to continue to grow on an average. You can see we just came out of a major pandemic, which could happen at any time again. And the ones that were called upon when those patients were at the critical edge and near death was the perfusionists who would keep them alive um, and help them recover. So practicing perfusionists tend to be quite happy as their career choice as well. Surveys that were conducted by the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion showed that nearly 90% of the practicing perfusionists said they would become a perfusionist if they had to make that career selection again today. And 95% said that they would recommend their career to their friends or their family members. So many of us here have our spouses that work. My wife is a perfusionist, my son is a perfusionist. Uh, so the AMSEC community, which is the American Society for Extraporeal Technology survey, mirrors those results, with 95% of respondents saying they were satisfied, delighted with their career as a perfusionist. So as you all begin this graduate program as perfusion students over the next 21 months, um, the program will be a challenge for most of you. And many 
uh, and may also be a challenge for your friends and your family, as it will keep you quite busy. However, in May 2025, you will have earned a rewarding career and a new way of life for yourself and your families. The ceremony here today will celebrate your transition to that new career. Again, we are pleased to welcome you all to LTU in this incredible profession. So uh, Dr. Sobe was asking an interesting question about the history of this. So if I can just take a couple of minutes and add to this. So our profession has been infused by a plethora of historical achievements, which have led to the development and endless armamentarium of technological advancements within the field of cardiac surgery. And it's really, so we're honoring the 70th year of the invention. So on May 6, 1953, Dr. Gibbon was able to perform the first successful open heart operation utilizing the heart-lung machine. He did this on an 18-year-old who was an undergraduate student who had uh, just kept routinely coming back in and out of the hospital for right ventricular failure. And what's important is always when you tell a story about a patient and a historical moment like that is always to add the patient's name. So that was Cecilia Bolvacek who was the patient for there. Um, in 2004, they honored her for her 51st year of survival after that operation. Um, Dr. Gibbon only did four operations with his heart-lung machine. He was a medical student at Thomas Jefferson University and graduated in 1927. He then was allowed to come to the Mass General under Dr. Edward Churchill. Um, Dr. Edward Churchill was the chief of surgery at Mass General and they were doing these endless cases of pulmonary embolectomies. Um, in his writings, they did 142 patients, only nine survivals. He had described it as a post-mortem examination once the operation and the corrective procedure started. So as Dr. Gimmon got involved in that, his assignment was to sit with one of these pulmonary embolism patients and sit up all night. He recorded her vital signs. And in his notes, he says, if only we could pull the blood from the right side of the heart and push it to the left side, this would be an easy operation. Because then what they were doing is they were blocking the cable with clamps and it was a run and go procedure. So the necessity of the heart lung machine was there. After he operated on Sevilla Bolvacek, and that was a success, the first patient had expired. She was a success. He did two more, which also expired. And he put a moratorium on heart surgery at Thomas Jefferson. And then there were other players in this that came in. So um, Dr. Kirkland, who was very astute and asked for the blueprints um, from Dr. Gibbons' machine, then took it to the Mayo Clinic and he modified it and they kind of streamlined it and went off to the races there. Now, if you look at the time period from 1950 to 55, there were five places in the world where you could have heart surgery. You could have it at the University of Minnesota, you could have it at the Mayo Clinic, you could have it at the University of Toronto, Thomas Jefferson Hospital, and Wayne State University with their affiliation with Harper Hospital. So this area has a rich, rich uh, history towards um, heart surgery. Now when we talk about Dr. Gibbon and his first success on May 6, 1953, on July 3rd, 1952, not far from here was Dr. Doudrill. Forrest Dewey Doudrill actually did the first successful heart surgery using a pump that was built by General Motors. He had come in contact with the research team at General Motors and they said, yeah, we can do this. There's money involved in this. Now after World War II, there did become money from the, from the NIH to, to fund a lot of this stuff, but corporate funding was important. And when he sat with GM, GM looked at him and said, we pump gasoline, we pump oil, we pump water, we can pump blood, that's no problem. So within a short period of time, they actually had a V12 Cadillac engine, which was the pump, and that is actually in the lobby at Harper Hospital where you can view it. So it's extraordinary. The only problem was is that he did not create an artificial lung. He made, it was the native lung of the patient that they were operating on that had to utilize to oxygenate it. So um, Dr. Gibbon was a true successful heart and lung machine operation. So, um, so with that, so we talk about the history. So well, it's important, I want to mention the patient. So Henry Opatek was a Polish gentleman from the area that was the first successful open heart uh, relationship. So when we talk about history, let's just briefly, I'll be quick, just let's talk about our history, how we ended up here. Um, about three and a half years ago, is it, that we've been at this, almost four years, that you know, we went around and around, we said, God, we have such a team of people that we know we can educate people and we can do it well and we have the passion to do it. But who are we gonna sit down? Who's actually gonna do it? So um, 
that became an enormous task that somehow shifted this way. And I opened up a blank laptop and said, I've done this two previous times. I always hesitate when I say that, I've done this too, because you may ask, well, what happened to the other two? You know? But it was that we started a school in New York, we started our own open heart program in New Hampshire, and then I was a graduate in Boston, and when I was there two months, they asked me to come in and run that program. And uh, that became an enormous task. It was just, I tried to move it to the University of New Hampshire, but here we are. So we created a curriculum. We started down that path. I said, well, if we're really going to do this, and I'm in the twilight of my career, I'm not doing any more of these. So I said, if we do this and we're going to do it well, how are we going to do it differently? So I did a cross analysis of the six schools that I really felt were the, were the best at the time at this. Took their curriculum, and then we really broke it down and said, well, we're going to offer this, this, and this, and we're going to take it to another level. And then as in anything, when you go through that task and you put it to writing and you have a proposal and you submit it to the university, you guys were, un I mean, you know, so we have this, we met with other schools, and then when we came here, and the people, it's just one of those things, you just know that it's a special place with special people. And Dr. Lee, you've mentioned before, but her and Olivia, I've said it last year, those are angels from the sky. I've learned in life, as you get older in life, you keep the flowers and discard the weeds. And there's a bouquet of roses here of people that we haven't even met yet. But everybody I meet, you look around here in this engineering school, the brilliance of the students that are here and the faculty is just extraordinary. So it works very well in sync with the technology that we have. Um, so we've done that. And I go back to the people. And the thing is, is that later in life, who, you know, life is about who you surround yourself with. And everyone on the faculty here, we all have our primary positions where we are clinicians, first and foremost, because the technology in this field changes so rapidly, you need to keep that skill set. And how can we offer you and be credible if we don't do that? So um, I can't thank the faculty um, enough. You guys are truly special people. So, um, so let me continue there. I'm going to go back on script. So as much as when you get me talking about these people here, it's really something special. So let me go through that. Today's ceremony is an important milestone because it symbolizes the start of your journey as a cardiovascular perfusion student. Throughout time, there has been many symbols of medicine. The caduceus originated in the ancient Egyptian and Middle Eastern um, cultures. The stethoscope in 1816 was a French invention, and the symbol of the Red Cross Crescent and crystal are a few in mind. The doctor's white coat has also become a universal symbol of medicine and signifies the turning point of the history of medicine. During the late 1800s and early 1900s, medicine underwent a radical and rapid change. As a result of the scientific method and modernization movement, the practice of medicine emerged as a respected discipline of science in an honorable profession. This identity required a new branding. So the white coat um, of the laboratory scientist was adopted. Now, the first white coat ceremony was at Columbia University in 1993, but the white coat was there to replace the dark and formal black attire of previous centuries with the fantastic discoveries that helped prevent more accurate diagnosis and in some cases definitively cure disease. Doctors became scientific healers and were well respected among all strata of society. So the white coat set them apart and civilized their knowledge, expertise, and even the hope of healing Today, many patients consider it a symbol of purity, professionalism, and trust. As the adoption of the white coat symbolizes a change in the trajectory of medicine, today's ceremony in the white coat you wear, you will wear during your time at LTU, will symbolize a change in your life and its trajectory. You are now entering an honorable scientific profession, or perhaps a calling, which it has been for all of us, in which you will be gifted the privilege of caring for others. You are now com committing to perpetual learning, and you are now committing the lives and the health of our patients, our colleagues, and our communities. The white coat is a symbol of your potential and the rite of passage. Remember, we all have to learn together. So as you strive to achieve your potential, use your time wisely to learn and grow cognitively, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So from all of us, we can honestly say congratulations and welcome to the graduate studies here at LTU. So. so um, the other part of this too was that putting together our faculty, we needed to find a, a state-of-the-art class, high-level cardiac surgeon to be involved in. 
and I say doing this profession, um, I'm more of a mental, I run a mental health clinic dealing with all the people that we have and the ORs that come through. And when you get into this profession, you're dealing with so many different personalities. Um, when I mentioned Dr. Kirkland um, and Dr. Dudrill, so Dr. Drew Dudrill was at Wayne State University and our medical director was a graduate of Wayne State University. He had then was so highly skilled, he was accepted to work with Dr. Kirkland who had left the Mayo Clinic and went to the University of Alabama. Um, so when we did this, I can honestly say, although he's a fantastic surgeon, he's a far better human being. So my dear friend, Dr. Robinson, if you'll come up and say a couple of words. Um, thank you for that, uh, that nice introduction. This is the first time I've seen, uh, seeing this, the class and, uh, uh, congratulations. Um, usually I don't read my, my, uh, my stuff and I'll, but I don't want to miss some of the things and I'll only read the first part after that. I'm totally going to wing it. Um, uh, cause I, I, I sit here. I'm an, I don't have a PhD like everyone else here. I am just the pretty face of the, of the program. Um, but, uh, you know, I want to thank uh, Dr. Grace, uh, Dr. Uh, Heist, and, uh, and Dr. Saab for, uh, for their presence, uh, for their support of this program, and uh, for being here today. And then, um, you know, I want to applaud you uh, for the uh, one knowing what a perfusionist was to even apply for the program. My wife is a perfusionist. I became a heart surgeon to keep track of my wife. Um, <laughs> but uh, when I say she's a perfusionist, they'll say, what organ does she play in the symphony? Uh, you know, most people, you have to explain uh, what a perfusionist does. Uh, uh, as was mentioned uh, earlier by Dr. Heist, most people will never know you. Uh, or what you do, except um, uh, the cardiac surgeons uh, certainly do uh, appreciate you. Um, I also want to applaud you for picking what I think is the most fascinating field in medicine. It's really the interaction of human beings and, and machines with the ultimate goal, not temporary support, but a totally implantable heart uh, is somewhere down the road in this field that uh, will deal with probably one of the most pressing uh, medical problems that we have, which is congestive heart failure and, and uh, the damaged heart and all of the billions of dollars uh, that, uh, that is consumed every year in, in the health industry on, on treating that. So uh, I wanna congratulate you um, the field that you've gone into is what's really allowed us as heart surgeons uh, to take on more complicated cases. Uh, as your technology and the equipment uh, in, with the heart-lung machine have improved, it's allowed us to do more complicated cases, uh, more difficult cases, and it's also uh, allowed us and the patients to have a, a smoother post-operative uh, course where we're not dealing with all the complications that come uh, with open heart surgeries, just kidney failure and strokes and, and things like that. So uh, again, uh, I applaud you for, uh, for that. And I thank you for choosing us. I know many of you had uh, different uh, opportunities to go elsewhere, but hopefully we can uh, um, uh, meet your expectations. So like I said last year, um, I, I did have a speech uh, prepared, but I left it in my lab coat. And so uh, when I got here, I, I didn't have it, so I had to, to, to kind of wing it. And um, I, I told a lot of stories about working with, with Dr. Kirkland, who, who you had mentioned uh, earlier, as taking the heart-lung machine uh, what appeared to be a failure and then committing to it. And uh, the commitment was that he was going to do 10 hearts, no matter what the outcome. 
If the, if the first nine died, he was gonna do the 10th. And to see that kind of resolve because you believe in the technology uh, that much and that's worth this risk. But I've heard the same thing from other surgeons as we've had to switch how we've done things in the past and then seen the complications of these repairs some 15 or 20 years later say there must be a better way. And we have to learn to do that in a better way. Even though it may cost something somewhere down along the line, that's the commitment that you make when you, um, when you start into this field. But going back to uh, uh, the, my talk last year, I, I quoted some sayings that Dr. Kirkland uh, had talked about, and, and I, I won't bore you with, with all of those, but I was thinking, what, what should I say? Because after last year's speech, people came up and said, wow, that was like, I have a dream kind of speech. <laughs> And uh, you know John Kennedy's. You know, remember, you probably don't remember him, but uh, you know he was uh, asked what America can do, and someone told me, hey, they taped it, or they taped it, and it's on YouTube. So I went on YouTube and looked. I had like seven views. Uh, five were from my wife. Uh, it was three were th up, and two were down from from her. Uh, but I thought, you know, I did a pretty good job, so uh, I'll, I'll kind of just wing it as I, uh, uh, I, I get up. And, you know, I, there's been a lot of serious uh, talk here about, you know, all the things that you got to do and work and whatever. But anyway, there was one of the second year students who just kind of slipped me uh, these recommendations. We, we kind of had a meeting looking at how things had gone the first year, things that we could take, make better, maybe do a little better on. And, and so I didn't, I didn't realize that, that they had, a, had a, their own meeting and made some suggestions. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read, read these. The first one is, uh, you should raise the tuition. <laughs> they said, this is, uh, it's way too cheap for the quality of education that they're getting. They, uh, <laughs> I don't, it's anonymous. Uh, it, it says it's way too low. They said, this is like the value, and other perfusionists might think less of them uh, because they came from a, a lower-priced institution. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, what is it, eight, $9,000, I, I, I think? Oh, that was my last year of medical school. Uh, anyway, uh, suggestion number two was uh, the program should be uh, six to nine months longer uh, than it currently is. Uh, there's just too much, uh, too much to learn. And number three, along the same lines, they said there should be less free time <laughs> on the weekends and nights. Uh, more late, uh, late night, early morning chat groups, <laughs> instructional videos, and, and lectures, and uh, idle hands are the devil's workshop. So, uh, you know, Okay, number five uh, was um, because the ORs uh, can really get cold. They thought uh, two to three weeks of outdoor classes in December and January uh, might acclimate you to, uh, uh, to that environment. Um, random pop-up quizzes on physics and uh, molecular interactions of plastic tubing and blood. I I, I was just reading about that last night for about five minutes. Uh, then, here's a good one. They wanted a uh, best student mentor award to go to a second year student with a $500 cash contribution from each of you uh, <laughs> towards the prize money uh, of that award. Um, a military style boot camp run by the senior students uh, that involves uh, you cleaning of their cars, <laughs> apartments, uh, and other sorted uh, chores so that you learn to pay attention to small details. Um, they wanted you here to practice saying yes sir or ma'am to the second year student. <laughs> really almost worship the second year students 
that's in anticipation of working with, with cardiac surgeons. Um, <laughs> Uh, they wanted you to have a week of sleep uh, deprivation just because. Uh, they wanted the use of the personal pronoun scum for each of you to reflect the inclusive nature of this program in regards to your mental uh, uh, capabilities. There will be no distinction between the brilliant and the average. Everybody's equal. So uh, we'll kind of take these uh, suggestions uh, into consideration and we'll make the necessary corrections and uh, uh, recommendations and we'll let you know how many of these things uh, uh, that we're going to uh, uh, adapt. Uh, but on a more, more serious note, last year we talked about uh, the beginning of, uh, uh, of this program and, and having a program. This year, we can talk about what this program actually has done and uh, what its accomplishments are and why you were so smart in uh, deciding to come here and us choosing you. First, as has been mentioned before, you, this is an excellent uh, faculty that you have. They come from various institutions, a lot of different perspectives, and in medicine, especially in cardiac surgery, you'll find there's a lot of ways of do things. Most heart surgeons can only agree on two things. Uh, one is it's better to repair a heart valve than replace it. And secondly, if you're going to do a bypass, then better use a mammary artery uh, than a vein or something else. Other than that, it's all open game. When you come from institutions that are inbred. Now, just as an example, I went to uh, to U University of Michigan. It's my second most loved school after this now. Uh, I met my wife there, three of our kids went there, and you know, I really hate Ohio State. <laughs> so there is a program that I worked in for years that all we had were graduates from Ohio State. They all did it the same way. There was no variation, nothing. And it got really annoying when I'd ask them how long between doses of cardioplegia, and if it was more than 10 minutes, they had to take their shoe off to continue to count uh, past uh, 10. I said, you know, there's other ways to, to do this, but they just wouldn't, wouldn't listen. But I think that you're going to get a wide variety, a wide exposure to uh, different clinical scenarios, different ways of looking at things uh, that's unique to here. Uh, you're gonna get an excellent clinical exposure in the hospitals. I understand that one of the students uh, who's a second year, uh, once she started clinicals from uh, May until this year has done 80 cases, uh, pumped 80 cases. You know, to kind of put that in perspective, you only need 40 cases a year to, to maintain your perfusion. So they're either really working or hard and those perfusionists are taking it easy um, or this is a really great thing. Um, you're going to get a superb exposure to ECMO. It was mentioned that was uh, a big uh, life-saving uh, tool with COVID. Uh, so uh, our program, you get a lot of exposure uh, to the ECMO circuit, the technologies the, and running that and the complications of that. You're going to get exposure to uh, electronic charting that's taken over medicine that uh, everything is documented in this big data age. Uh, all the information is collected and then you can go back and look at it and draw out uh, uh, conclusions from, uh, uh, from that data, especially if uh, uh, something isn't going the way that you, um, you would expect it. Um, working with CCS, you, in combination with the school, you're gonna get uh, exposure to a lot of the newer technologies that industry is giving to support one of the largest uh, perfusion companies uh, in the United States. So there's a lot of uh, uh, advantages to being here. Um, <clears throat> the, um, um, last thing I wanted to say was uh, thank you for choosing us and our commitment uh, is to provide you with all the tools necessary uh, for you to become an excellent uh, clinical perfusionist 
and a significant um, contributor to your field. The only quote I'll leave you with from Dr. Kirkland was uh, he had many, uh, I'll leave you more than one. One I liked a couple, like uh, guided me along is uh, chance favors the prepared mind. If you've already dealt with the issue before it ever happens, then you know exactly what to do when it does happen. And I remember asking him one time about to become a cardiac surgeon that uh, did I, uh, were there too many cardiac surgeons in the United States uh, or across the world? And he said, uh, there's always room at the top. It's the bottom that's crowded. <laughs> so aim high and uh, you'll be successful. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Robinson. We are so lucky to have him as our medical advisor, and we'll take uh, some of those second-year suggestions under advisement, but can't make any promises, so. <laughs> um, next, we're going to be doing the white, coats, the white coats and distributing them to you guys, so I'm going to ask Patty Finelli to come up and um, Dr. McCusker as well, and we will pass those up. First, it's Mackenzie Black. <laughs> Renee Blevins. <laughs> Thomas Deeb. David Keller. <laughs> Megan Kelly. <laughs> Anthony O'Donnell. Terrence Priest. <laughs> Zachary Roberts. Miranda Ryder Miller. Stacy Samojedny. <laughs> Morgan Stid oh boy. <laughs> Morgan Stidnitzi. <laughs> She'll I'll work on that. <laughs> I will have it down by graduation. <laughs> and Lindsay Thelen. Now I'm going to have all of the perfusion students stand, and we are going to read the cardiovascular perfusion pledge. Um, you should all have a little booklet there, and it's on the back. So you guys can read it with me. <laughs> Today, we, the class of 2025, embark upon our medical journey as future perfusionists. To our patients, our communities, our colleagues, our profession, and ourselves, we make these promises. To our patients, 
We will advocate for all persons by serving the individual. We will practice with compassion and preserve our empathy. As perfusion professionals, we shall respect the patient's rights and dignity and shall uphold the doctrine of confidentiality regarding privileged patient information. To our community, we promise to be mindful leaders, to collaborate and to serve. We will share our knowledge, enthusiasm, and spirit through open channels with those around us. We will strive for social justice to foster a healthy society. To our colleagues and our profession, we promise to maintain a lifelong curiosity to dedicate ourselves to innovation and discovery. We will rely on the strengths of our peers to transcend the boundaries of our own abilities. We will build relationships founded upon respect to share mutual responsibility in maintaining the ethics of care. As perfusion professionals, we must uphold the dignity and honor of the profession, accept its disciplines, and expose without hesitation illegal, unethical, and incompetent conduct. To ourselves, we promise to hold ourselves to the highest standard, to always strive for greater proficiency. We will balance the many faucets of our profession by caring for our patients, our families, and ourselves. We will maintain awe for the gravity of our responsibility to conduct ourselves with dignity and courage. Welcome all of you to the perfusion profession. Congratulations. I'm going to have Dr. McCusker come up for some closing remarks. If we could just squeeze in a couple more things here. So <laughs> I won't talk all. I'll get through this. So uh, just, again, congratulations to you guys. Um, now, every time you put on your white coat, remember how you feel right now. Try and hold on to that. You work so hard to get to this point in your life. You truly have. Um, each experience that you had on your way here was tremendously important. It made you who you are today. Remember all these experiences and value them. Be, be proud of what you've accomplished and what you will accomplish. This should inspire you to always do your best. Whether it is while you are in classes, on your clinical rotations in 10 months, or in your practice as a perfusionist, your patients will be the one who benefit, but so will you. You're about to embark on the journey that will change your life. Please do not let this excitement fade. We know life will be stressful over the next 21 months and beyond, but try to remember how excited you are to learn and practice perfusion. Because as a clinician, learning never ends. Always be curious. It's what stimulates learning. Pursue knowledge to satisfy the curiosity. Drink from the fountain of knowledge as often as possible. Remain curious about your patients and their inflictions. It will help you to be a better clinician and your patient will benefit. So again, congratulations on being here. We're so happy to welcome you to the LTU family. But wait, let me just add one more. So five things. So it's, I try and leave you with always a little something. It's the four A's. One night we sat around after a cardiac arrest for the STS meeting with a group of surgeons and surgeons who had been in the field for a long time. And it's kind of ironic that everyone, when I asked them to give me a word as a sum up of how you would describe what you need to be long term in this profession, in this profession, and almost everyone came up with a word starting with A. So for one, it's availability. Be available. There's research to be done, there's an extra case to be done, and you wanna carry that over into your profession as well. It's affability, right? Affability, it's, we work as a team in the OR, and it's a ballet that's choreographed, so there's balance to that. Um, don't be obsequious where you're just going to be that yes person because a yes person could actually do harm to a patient. So question everything, but, but be able to get along. Third is the ability. You truly have to have the ability. You could be the greatest architect in the world, but if your buildings are falling down, you never had the ability. So have the ability. And that comes from years of pursuing your dreams and the passion for what you do. Fourth would be accountability. I think there's no... Um, now, part of our biggest ports of research is accountability of how we keep perfusionists accountable with, uh, with the TALIS system that's monitoring at each bypass, um, right? Take, own your, your, your actions. And the fifth is also affordability. You may need to take a job with less money until you can prove yourself, but be affordable. So with those things, if you leave here today. But again, congratulations to you all. And I want to thank you all for coming and attending.
I want to thank the faculty, the administration. Um, without everyone here in this room, it would not be possible. And it just gives me tingles every time we come together in this. So congratulations. Thanks. Oh, oh can you guys come up and around so they can do pictures? Yeah. OK. All right. Great. But thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, buddy. Oh, well, goodness. Yeah, no, I love it. I know. Oh, great. I, 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 I keep going. I love the talk. Yeah, yeah. oh, yeah. I know. But if we limit it for time, there's so much to say about it. I, believe me, I, I get it. Him and I could go on for hours. Oh, thank you. Thanks for coming. should come in.